it's great to see such a, a full room. Uh, but we'll come back to that in a moment. But I want to take advantage of this meeting of the society to make an award. We recently instituted an uh, award for lifetime achievement in the field of computer conservation. And I'm delighted to announce today that we're making one to Chris Burton. It would be entirely remiss uh, not to make you all aware of the amazing achievement on which this is based. So forgive me for reading it because I would hate to miss something out. My memory is not as good as it was. There we are. It's for outstanding services in relation to computer conservation including as initiator of the pioneering project to reconstruct the replica of the small-scale experimental machine, nicknamed Baby, and as, a, as team leader for its ongoing maintenance and demonstration. Now, Chris graduated in electrical engineering at the University of Birmingham. He worked on computer hardware, software and systems development in Ferranti Limited and then ICT and ICL nearly all based in the Manchester area, from 1957 until retiring from the industry in 1989. <coughs> as I've said, Chris was responsible as initiator and team leader for the astonishingly detailed and ambitious pioneering project since 1994 to reconstruct the authentic, full-size, fully working replica of the SSEM, or baby. The original of which first ran a programme in 1948. The importance of the original computer conceived and built at Manchester is that it was the world's first stored programme electronic digital computer containing all the basic elements from which modern electronic computers have developed. The reconstruction of the SSEM remains the most influential of all the influential computer reconstruction and restoration projects and illustrates the fundamental importance of UK computing in computing history. This reconstruction was a world first, it was ambitious, unprecedented in scale, and its successful completion set the standard for other sub-projects, both in terms of technology and historical authenticity. It is demonstrated that these projects were both possible and achievable, and historic, and has made substantial, substantial social and public value contribution. Computer restoration has now become a thriving international movement and Chris Burton's sustained and pioneering work is acknowledged worldwide. This is not all. Following the successful reconstruction of the baby uh, that first went on public display in the Museum of Science and Industry in Manchester as the centrepiece of its 50th anniversary celebration, he's continued in other projects he maintains the baby as well as an authentic working computer and regularly demonstrates it to large crowds visiting the MSI. For re reconstructing the baby, Chris was awarded in 1998 an honor honorary degree by the University of Manchester, the first Lovelace Gold Medal by the British Computer Society and a Chairman's Gold Award for Excellence by ICL. But I said this isn't all. He's also been an active participant in additional CCS projects to restore or reconstruct other historical, historically significant computers. The Elliott 401, the Ferranti Pegasus, and indeed the Cambridge EDSAC replica, which ties the link back neatly between the digital computers at this EDSAC at Cambridge, and of course the first at Manchester, and that was the axis for the the British computer world as we know it. Now Chris has demonstrated a combination of depth, breadth, consistently selfless committee commitment in all these projects. And in the society he's been a key member since he, he was one of the founders in 1989 and his advice to us all and his con contributions even today with the committee have been absolutely outstanding and gratefully received. Chris, I'd be delighted if you'd come up and receive it.
surprised everybody to know that this is a total surprise to me. <laughs> <laughs> it was only by chance that I decided to come to this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Well, as a technologist uh, and marketeer as well as a technologist, opportunism is <laughs> very <laughs> Signals, an officer, which I was in my younger days, I'm very proud of. And secondly, of course, Leo is part of the story. And when I first left the University of Manchester, my first job as an electric engineer, I worked for London Transport on the Victoria Line. And we used the Leo to do case study analysis on various aspects of the design, the macro design challenges of a new world. So I started my career in IT as a user. And thanks to Leo, I was the user of Leo. I will say no more, but welcome Neville to the floor to tell us his story. And rather intriguingly, 
his father was now shown as picture dealer. So there seems to have been a bit of a moral reversal. Um, Joe's pictures achieved some considerable distinction in later life when he exhibited them at the Royal Institute of Painters in Watercolours, the, water, water, the RI. And he sold some of his work to the great and the good, including an admiral in the Royal Navy and the private secretary, the Chancellor of the Exchequer. As a young man, he used to write music hall sketches, melodramas, and songs. And he sold them to theatre goers in the vestibule of his local theatre. And it was there that he met his future wife, whose father was the theatre manager, and her, mother, and her mother was an actress. And one of his melodramas was put on at London's West End Palace Theatre, Cambridge Circus. Not, so, not a long way from here, in fact. And there's the handbill uh, which shows Out West, Story of California Life by Joseph Lyon. You see, he was put on, these were put on as morning performances on Saturdays, the sort of things that we used to have in our childhood as cinema performances on Saturdays. So they were only fairly short things, but there we are. That's one of the things that Joe's uh, achieved. He also wrote a couple of detective stories, um, one called The Master Crime, and the other one, The Treasure of the Temple. And that's the cover book, cover of the Master Crime book, one shilling, and they were called Shilling Shockers, I believe, at the time. Well, there we are. Joe was multi-talented, highly intelligent, generous, and a good mixer. And you'll see later that his connection with the theatre and his creative talents were to prove enormously useful in the showmanship that characterised the business of Jay Lyons and Company. So, how did it all happen? In the late 19th century, with the unlikely scene of cigar management, there were two families uh, who had emigrated from Northern Europe by name Salmon and Luxteen, and they set up a family cigar manufacturing business in London. And they expanded into tobacco retailing, and by the 1880s they had become the largest tobacco retailers in the world. Here's one of their outlets, one of their smart looking outlets, which was spread across the country with Salmon Gluckstein emblazoned across the top. And so it was the start of this story, a thriving tobacco industry. Um, the period was marked by huge public interest in the great Victorian exhibitions up and down the country. Montague Gluckstein, who was one of the three company directors, used to market his company's tobacco products at these exhibitions, and he was quite appalled at the catering arrangement. Refreshments of these exhibitions were highly priced, highly priced and of very poor quality. So he seized on the idea of expanding into the field of exhibition catering to bring about those badly needed improvements. But the older members of the family were reluctant. They didn't want to get their good business name uh, associated with the catering scene, um, which was looked upon as a very down market. See on that slide. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, not our cup of tea. Never want to take no for an answer. Montague worked tirelessly to solve this dilemma, and after a great deal of self searching, the family company members finally agreed to go along and fund this undertaking on the strict understanding that their family names were not to be used and some of their names should be used to front the business. Well, you're ahead of me by now, I'm sure, because this is where Joe comes into the scene. He and Montague were family friends. Montague knew that Joe had cultivated important commercial friendships and he had knowledge of exhibition procedures uh, with a very outgoing personality. In short, he had the right qualities to come on board as a co-founder of a fledgling catering company and to give his name to it. The so Montague approached him. He happened to be uh, in Liverpool at the time, manning a store, which I was thinking was selling his paintings and his artist supplies. And much to his delight, the whole challenging idea immediately approached him, uh, appealed to him, uh, and in an interview with the London Evening News, some years later, he said, this is Joe, saying, I had personal and painful experience of the deplorable way in which the public were catered for. 
Well, the important thing now was that Joe agreed to his name being used for the firm, and it was to be registered as a trade arms and company. But you mustn't imagine that Joe was just going to be the front man. Part of the agreement was that he should be appointed chairman for life. The year was now 1887. He was 39 years old, not exactly a youngster, but he lived for another 30 years, so he remained chairman for that unusually long time. Joe <coughs> agreed 30 years as chairman. These were to be informative and highly progressive years in which Joe was to play a very active part. He was to die in 1917 <coughs> without issue, but the company continued to run as J. Lyons & Co. for another 60 years after his death. So let me share with you this unique story of inspiration and endeavour. It was 1887, year of Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee, year of great festivity, exhibitions all over the country, and no better time for the embryo company to start on its great enterprise as exhibition caterers. As a trial run, they tendered for contract for their Newcastle Jubilee exhibition, and they won this hand now because of their original ideas. And these included not just catering, but of course a large tobacco display with cigar-making demonstration and an orchestra which was well known at the time, known as the Blue Hungarian Band, playing in the refreshment area. This was quite an innovation itself. No exhibition had before had a band playing in the refreshment area. Um, also, uh, the, uh, I'm actually going to show you before I go on the, the menu for this first contract. Um, the left hand side is the cover of the menu. You probably won't be able to read what it says. I'll just tell you what the salient points are. A refreshment for at Newcastle on time, 1887. The first catering contract carried out by Jay Lyons and Co. I think that in itself is uh, an ambitious statement because how did they know at the time that they were going to be able to continue with contracts? So <laughs> there they are, greatly confident. The tea and coffee used in this cafe may be had of the attendance. In fact, they weren't, you know, used to see, they were selling tea and coffee in addition to actually serving it. And uh, you may be amused to see Stuart celebrated tea in lead packets um, uh, to them sixpence. We didn't have food standards in those days, but we know today. And the coffee, which was freshly roasted and ground hourly in the cafe per pound, one shilling eightpence. It says there, Indo-Chinese for video cafe, you can see the sort of architecture that uh, lent, uh, lent it that name, um, and tea, especially made for each customer, coffee freshly roasted and ground and con infused continuously. So that was the very first um, menu for the very first contract. The standard of tea and light refreshments and their reasonable pricing, these are what made a great hit with the fizzing public. Now as part of a catering contract, Mark you. Joe also designed an archery and rifle shooting range. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was very popular, particularly among the uh, soldiers who attended, uh, showing off their skills to their girlfriends. Uh, it was the first of its kind in this country, and it made such a hit that the Admiralty invited him to Portsmouth to advise on setting up a torpedo firing range. <laughs> <laughs> Well, followed by this ex first exhibition catering, we had uh, successful contracts at the exhibition in Glasgow and another one in Paris. But the next milestone, two years after Newcastle, in 1889, the company arrived at Olympia. The new Olympia exhibition halls had recently opened in London and Lyons won the catering contract for the first Barnum Bailey Circus. Sorry, I've got one too many on that. Uh, first Barnum Bailey Circus uh, that was run at Olympia. And this was the start of a long term association of the company with events at Olympia. It went on for many, many years afterwards. But they originally set up their headquarters in offices in the basement of Olympia. But that soon became too small, and so they moved to premises just along the Hammersmith Road from Olympia, which became known as Cadby Hall. As you see on that slide, 
Cadbury, Charles Cadbury was a piano manufacturer who occupied those premises, but after his death, the company was able to acquire the premises and they expanded very considerably over the years. They became the site for their main factory and they remained the hub of the organization for most of the company's life. I'll say a little more about that later on. But here in the early stages are the horse-drawn wagons formed up in the courtyard of Cadbury Hall. Well, the next real line was 1894. The company had been trading for seven years as exhibition caterers, but this was the year they became a public company, and they really became known to the public because they seized on the brilliant idea of opening tea shops. Up to that time, the main form of public refreshment were coffee houses, and these were essentially men-only establishments, and pretty grubby places they were too. So, providing tea shops of good quality, reasonably priced, was a very welcome step for everyone. Uh, sorry, I'm one too many again. That's the one, um, that was the very first tea shop. We saw that on the first slide. Um, Lyons acquired premises that had belonged to a harness maker in a side street known as Eagle Place, uh, adjoining Piccadilly to German Street. Eagle Place is still there, but of course the tea shop isn't. But it was here that history was made on the 20th of September, 1894, when they opened this first tea shop, 213 Piccadilly. The plaque in the middle was later added to show it was the first tea shop, and it remained open for that unusually long time, in fact, a total, as you see, of 82 years. That it was, I think, the longest uh, period for any of the tea shops to remain open. Well, it did cause a sensation the very first day. Queues formed early, customers waited outside on benches, which the management had thoughtfully provided for them. Tea was freshly made for each customer, yet it was realistic in price. And on the outside, the lane, J. Lyons and Co. Limited was embossed in pure gold leaf, and that design remained virtually unchanged uh, for all the tea shops. Well, over the next 75 years, they opened many. In their heyday, there were 250 open at one time. They were mainly in London, and at one time, at least nine tea shops were open in Oxford Street alone. Nine in Oxford Street. There were many others scattered across the country in large cities and towns, as far north as Blackpool, as far east as Ipswich, in the west, we had Western Supermare and uh, Exeter. And on the south coast of England, practically every seaside town on the south coast had at least one tea shop. Brighton had four tea shops. Well, on this next slide, uh, you can see just examples of some of those tea shops. I'm showing you 321 Oxford Street because that was one of those nine that I mentioned before. Uh, they try to, to select corner sites as much as they can for obvious reasons. Um, they were more apparent to passers by. And people do sometimes get mixed up with corner tea shops and corner houses. Uh, quite different. I'll talk about corner houses later. The one on Ealing Broadway I'm showing you just to demonstrate the sort of uh, shop fronts they had uh, with a huge range of products for sale to customers and to passers by. The one at Margate, I think, was the only tea shop that had an external roof cafe, facing, in this case, Margate Pier. And Plymouth, uh, that opened post-war to replace the tea shop that had been bombed, completely gutted, uh, during the war. Several tea shops were bombed during the war. Uh, several were completely bombed out, and tea, uh, Plymouth was one of them. But as you see, um, they kept the logo, Jane Lyons and Company, uh, rather more modern architecture, <coughs> but still the same um, display of, of products in the window. Uh, <coughs> in each tea shop, the food and beverages charges were identical, irrespective of locality. And attention to detail and hygiene was one of the secrets of their success. There would always be that front retail shop and the tea became uh, known to the public as the best on the market. Well, now we come to the corner house. 
houses. They came on the scene in 1909 when the company opened the very first one at Coventry Street. Coventry Street um, near Leicester Square, between Mr. Piccadilly and the Circus and Leicester Square. And whenever I mention corner houses, someone always says, Oh, I remember being taken there by my parents, having my first knickerbocker of glory, or well on the rank pie, the meringue about fish five inches high. Well, um, some of you have probably got similar memories. Uh, there were eventually four of these corner houses in London. Uh, Coventry Street, which was the flagship, and then there was the Strand, not a million miles from here. In fact, the Strand was between Charing Cross Station and Trafalgar Square. And if you were to pass that site now, you will see it's occupied by Boots the Chemist. The Oxford. That was on the corner of Oxford Street and uh, Tottenham Court Road. And uh, this is the Oxford Street entrance. Uh, you'll see, uh, you may note on the left, uh, there's a Wimpy bar. I'll talk about Wimpy a little later on. And then there's one of these nine Joe Lyons tea shops in Oxford Street. And the fourth one was the Marble Lodge Corner House. That's just one of the restaurants within the corner house itself. Uh, all the corner houses were huge. They had restaurants on four or five levels, and each of them employed around 400 staff. The Country Street one was the largest, and it could seat up to 4,000 customers at any one time. Uh, the splendor and glamour of these corner houses could be quite daunting, particularly for children visiting for the first time. There were huge chandeliers all over the place, there were rubber plants, waving palms, vast mirrors, glittering glass cabinets. Uh, there was live music playing to the diners almost continuously throughout the day and evening. And the music ranged from 12-piece dance bands through palm court orchestras to Hungarian gypsy trios. And even at the uh, Pompey Street corner house, sorry, on one word, the uh, flamenco room, the uh, flamenco dancers. Uh, that next slide uh, is the brasserie in the Oxford corner house. I've shown it because you see in the top right hand corner one of those uh, bands playing to the customers. And the Ivy Benson Girls Band, they used to play regularly at the Marble Arch Corner House. At every corner house, there was a food stall on the ground, food hall on the ground floor, and there were daily food delivery services to any address in London. And within the corner houses, some of the restaurants had their own individual menus and names to go with them. As you see on that slide, bacon and egg, a grill and cheese, and then there was the restful tray, and that was um, a wartime development, or uh, that remained post-war as well, when they brought in self-service. And there was always a salad bar where you could uh, replenish your plate to your heart's content. And the corner houses became very well known as the Four Corners of London. Meet me at the corner house became a household phrase, and they became well-known meeting places for courting couples and certain other liaisons, uh, such as that one. <laughs> Remember who that was? Uh, Leslie, Leslie Phillips. Sorry, keep clicking the wrong one. Uh, and his friend. <laughs> Moving on swiftly, um, I come now to the Nippins. From the opening of the very first tea shop in 1894, until the start of self-service in World War II, the company employed mainly female staff in their tea shops and their corner houses. And after the war, they returned to the corner houses, which is where you may have seen the nippies. This is the front page of the Lions Mail, in-house magazine. Uh, the significance of those dates, of course, is that they were celebrating the 40th anniversary of them becoming a public company. But the reason I'm showing it to you is to show you the differences in design of the, of the waitresses' costumes. The one on the left were the early ones, the Victorian and Edwardian, a rather hard serge material, must have been rather uncomfortable, 
and corseted heavily because the, uh, the caption says, waists were 17 inches in my day. <laughs> well, after First World War, the company decided they'd better bring their costumes more up to date, and this is when the one on the right came in. In fact, it came in in January 1925, 1st of January, uh, the waitresses appeared with these new costumes, uh, transformed overnight into modern dress. Well, at the same time, the company decided to give their new look girls a new name, because what I haven't told you is up to now, they were always known as Gladyses. <laughs> Everybody laughs at that, but I think probably Gladys was um, probably a popular name in, at that, in those early days. Well, they then had a staff competition, uh, which gave rise to many ideas, very many peculiar ideas, such as Miss Natty, Busy Bertha, Destress Dora, uh, Lyora of Lyons, but none had quite the right ring, and they finally struck on the word nippy, which had that endearing feel, but also the right overtones of swiftness and efficiency. At a talk that I gave recently, a lady in the audience told me afterwards that her mother had been a nippy, but her name was Gladys. <laughs> <laughs> so there we go. Um, now, here are three nippies. Um, actually, only one is a genuine nippy. I think it probably won't take long to guess that, that that's the one on the left. Mm -hmm. The other two were actresses, which I'll talk about in a moment. But going back to the one on the left, she was uh, taken at uh, the Marble Arch Corn Hours, and you could see the um, very precise dress. They had to do three weeks training, um, and they had to wear their costumes um, extremely efficiently. You all had those white Peter Pan collars, and you had those caps, or they became known as carrot coronets, uh, with the logo, had, which had to be directly in line with the nose. <laughs> and they had 20 sets, or 30 sets, I should say, of buttons, 30 sets of two buttons, which had to be stone, sewn by hand in a red cotton cross stitch and woe betide any nippy who lost a button and re one without red cotton or cross stitch. This training was conducted or overseen by a former waitress who started her service with the Lyons Tea Shop in 1897 and she remained with the company for 60 years. Uh, she was, her name was Nell, Bale, Nell Bacon, and uh, she was in charge of the training of the nippies. Well, this new nippy look caught on beyond the promoter's wildest dreams, and named after the nippy were a rose, with the Chelsea Flower Show, uh, as well as a, ra a railway engine, a racehorse, and the Battle of Britain Spitfire, Large also produced chocolates, a brand of chocolates and cigarettes called the Nippy, and the directors used to visit hospitals at Christmas time, wait for it, to distribute cigarettes to the patients. <laughs> <laughs> Times have changed. <laughs> well, the actress Billy Hale was one of those actresses that I showed you on that slide of three. Uh, and put on this uh, production of Libby uh, at the Prince Edward Theatre, in which uh, Billy Hale starred. And the caption says, Hale and charming Libby, Miss Billy Hale as the heroine in the new and successful musical comedy Libby at the Prince Edward Theatre, London. And that was in 1930. Um, Now, I've told you something about the tea shops and corner houses, but there's another restaurant that certainly deserves a place in history, and that was the Trocadero Troc restaurant. That's a lovely picture, but that was done much later than it was actually opened. That would have been done in the 1930s. But the Trocadero itself opened in 1896, uh, just two years after the first tea shop, as it happened. 
And here is the splendidly appointed entrance lounge, uh, which uh, some of you may remember, because I'm sure a lot of people went to the Trocadero restaurant. You see the chocolate, chocolate counter, large brand only, on the left, and they always employed those little page boys at the Trocadero. Well, the Trocadero opened literally in the blaze of glory, fireworks displayed in Brigadier Circus, Joe presided over the inaugural dinner. It was attended by the Lord Mayor and some of the best known figures of Victorian society from many walks of life. And there was, for example, Sir Harim Maxim. And he was a prolific inventor. He was mainly known for the machine gun, which was used by the British Army in the Boer War. There's a well-known cartoonist, Phil May. And he was renowned for his drawings of London life, and he was on the staff of Punch. There was a young naval commander, John Jellicoe, who was to become the admiral commanding the fleet at Jutland and then the first sea lord. Well, this just illustrates the range of friends and contacts that Joe had acquired. At the end of the evening, Joe's sister-in-law, who was uh, singing in the Doyle Cart Opera Company, sang the national anthem, and the singing of the national anthem became customary each night at closing time right up to the outbreak of uh, World War II. Before I leave this slide, take a look at the balcony and staircase, because on the next slide, in glorious technical, you will see, um, and you'll see at the top is that um, the murals, which were all uh, knights of the round table. Concert teams were introduced at the Trocadero during World War I, Cabaret was introduced in the 1920s, continuing every night until the outbreak of the Second World War. Charles Cochrane, a leading impresario of the time, staged many successful shows there. And there was a chorus line which became known as the Cochrane Young Ladies. And among those who cut their teeth as dancers were ladies like Jessie Matthews. And there was a certain Florence Marjorie Robinson. Now, she was one of those actresses I showed on that previous slide. But I put her AKA there because she did become a very well-known actress and film star. Could anyone tell me who she then? Anna Nagel. Don't be shy to call it out. Anna Nagel. I heard somebody say something. Anna Nagel. Anna Nagel it was, yes. I don't know how you knew that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, she was. Um, she did become. Uh, <coughs> um, so started her life, started her life as a dancer at uh, the Trocadero. Well, not content with just exhibition and restaurant catering, the management also turned their attention to hotels, and more than 40 hotels eventually became under the land's ownership. But I'm just going to show you four of these. Strand Palace was the first, again, very adjacent to where we are at the moment. Uh, that opened in 1909, and it became a great hit uh, when it opened. It had hot and cold water in the bedrooms, and it was the, probably the first hotel in this country that had that facility. Um, then the Regent Palace opened in 1915, and was the largest in Europe at the time. It had a thousand, over a thousand rooms, and they were employing more than a thousand staff. The hotel was bombed twice during the Second World War, but like its neighbouring Windmill Theatre, it never closed, and it remained open until 2006, of course under different management. The Cumberland Hotel at Marble Arch, that was opened in 1933 by the then Duke and Duchess of York, later the King George VI and Queen Elizabeth, and that represented the peak of their hotel programme right up to date right up to the post uh, pre-war era, and the latest in luxury. Uh, the Marble Arch Corner House was right next door, and it opened at the same time, 1933. And then there was the post-war Tower Hotel, and that opened in 1973 uh, near the Tower of London, uh, in St. Catherine's Dock. Well, of those four, only the Regent Palace no longer exists. Um, now, the others, as I mentioned, are still open under different management, but the Regent 
palace was uh, there until like 2006. Um, but I'm happy to tell you, and some of them that you may have visited, a brasserie called Zedel. Um, Regent Palace Grill Room was below the Regent Palace, and Zedel Brasserie occupies that same grill room. So you can see the structure, the architecture, the those lovely marble pillars of the Art Deco arrangement is still there. Thoroughly recommended. Um, don't hold any shares in it, but it's well worth going to I tell you as you know. Um, well, you'll be thinking by now that there's nothing that Jay Barnes could not achieve. There were the Buckingham Palace garden parties. Uh, Buckingham Palace Garden Parties. That picture was taken in July 1951, when Court George VI and Queen Elizabeth were still on the throne. And it was common practice to employ nippies from each of the tea shops and restaurants. They're not wearing their coronets on this occasion. They probably didn't want to upstage the Queen. <laughs> uh, the largest number ever catered for was 15,000 in the 1930s. And that's twice the number at today's garden parties. A guest at one of the parties was heard to comment on the quality of the tea, to which her friend replied, that's not surprising. You know, the Queen Mother was a Beau's lamb. <laughs> well, now, uh, what about other events? There were the catering events at Windsor Castle, the Guild Hall for the Lord Mayor's Banquets, Wimbledon Strawberry Teas, and of course the Chelsea Flower Shows, on which you see in the next slide. Uh, sorry, I keep doing this. Uh, Yes, uh, Nippy's off duty at the Chelsea Lunch Show. <coughs> well, going on to the next slide, we mustn't forget that this whole enterprise started off with exhibition catering. And while this continued regularly at Olympia, one of their most impressive feats in this field has to be the British Empire Artists exhibition in 1924. The Wembley Stadium had opened just a year before, 1923. And the exhibition occupied 220 acres with the stadium as centerpiece. But the great thing about the catering was that the Lions Company operated 34 restaurants and cafes, 18 snack bars and kiosks. They served up to 26,000 customers each day, and they employed 8,000 staff. Uh, the exhibition, uh, you'll see, uh, says April to October, so it was open for just six months. But it was such a successful exhibition that they decided to open it again the following year, in 1925. Well, as you can imagine, the large resources had been so stretched that they very wisely decided that one year had been rough for them, and in the event, no other single company could be found to take on that huge commitment. And the contract for the second year had to be shared by six different companies. Well, this gave Lange the opportunity to organize the following year, in 1925, the so-called Feast of the 8,000 Freemasons. This was the most spectacular of the many luncheons and dinners that the company had organized at Olympia in the Grand Hall. It was for the Masonic Festival, which was a peace memorial fundraising event after the First World War. The <coughs> Masons attended from all over the world, and they raised more than a million pounds towards the building of the Freemasons Grand Lodge in Great Queen Street. 1,300 nippies had been brought from all over the country, specially trained, with 700 cooks and porters. There was one and a half mile tables, and the floral arrangements on each table um, took uh, 40 florists 14 hours to arrange. Um, 
where, as you can imagine, it has been conducted with military precision by one of the company directors who sat in the gallery above the banquet area. Every movement of every nippy was pre-plotted, and all commands were by bells and coloured lights. <laughs> this was 1925, before the age of a mobile phone. Never knows what it would be like today. Um, I'm going to tell you a little about the company products. These are just a few of the products that might ring a bell. Uh, the tea, which we've spoken about. The Swiss rolls. They produced a huge number of Swiss rolls. Um, in fact, it amounted to 36 miles of Swiss roll in a week. <laughs> so that was the statistics. This was in the 1920s. Even. <coughs> Lyons coffee, uh, in the as a large Dundee, individual fruit pies and Palomade ice creams, but uh, those are just a few of the products. Um, my next slide, I'm going to show you the enormous facilities at Cabby Hall. Uh, they expanded into 13 acres, and just to sort of get you orientated, up there is Olympia. This is the Hammersmith Road, and that road normally is Brook Green. And you can see the huge number of bakeries they have. There's a bread bakery, a cake bakery, individual fruit pie bakery, uh, bakeries and kitchens over there, ice cream factory. We had a, 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 a supermarket. What happened was that they opened the store for the staff, but it became so well used and so popular they decided to turn it into a supermarket. And it became one of the very first supermarkets, which was opened in 1955. And then up here is the administrative drop with a medical department, which tended to any uh, employee who might fall sick during the day. Uh, they had very excellent facilities. And it was run uh, by a doctor who was uh, appropriately named. His name was Dr. Blood. <laughs> and in fact, if anybody of you know uh, Leo's situation, his daughter uh, was Mary Blood, who became Mary Coombs, uh, and she's still around as one of the very first female programmers on Leo. So that's sort of the, the blood uh, part. Um, then we had um, laboratories, and over a short period of two years, um, Margaret Thatcher worked there. When she left Oxford, she, uh, Oxford University, she'd been trained as a chemist and she said to be working on uh, the pioneering of soft scoop ice cream. Uh, so that's the fame that the laboratories had. And one other thing that would interest uh, the other people, that's Elm's House. Um, that is the only part of Cabby Hall, well it's an adjunct actually to Cabby Hall, and it was built in the 1930s to accommodate 1,500 clerks. It eventually accommodated Leo. Leo II and Leo III were housed in Elm's house. And that's the only part of Cabby Hall that's still in existence. <coughs> well, after the First World War, uh, you'll probably notice, by the way, uh, there's no mention there of tea or coffee. The fact was, um, Cabby Hall came, became too small for the development, manufacture of tea or coffee. And so after the First World War, they had to open a new factory at Greenford, uh, west of London. And that's an artist's impression of the Greenford complex. Uh, along the way <coughs> is the Grand Union Canal, uh, and tea, raw tea, uh, was developed, was actually delivered. Raw tea came from Lyons Estate in Nyasaland, which we now know as Malawi, and they had their own tea estate. That was brought in by sea to uh, Tilbury Docks, then brought along the river and the Grand Union Canal and up to Greenford. And the British products were taken by rail and road. You can see at the bottom here is the Great, uh, Great Western Railway, and that is the siding into the, uh, into the complex. 
And I'm going to show you on the next slide. Uh, that's a, a publicity slide, actually, <laughs> or photograph, which says three ways to run to Lyons Queen Food Factory. What it should really say is three ways from Lyons Queen Food Factory, because you see the empty barge which has just left the factory, and the finished product being taken from the factory by tea, uh, by uh, train and by road. Those vehicles, as a matter of interest, were driven by steam. They were steam lorries. Um, Lyons employed a, a fleet of 30 steam-driven lorries in the 1920s. Um, the only, only problem with sending them on long distances, they had to be fairly near a water supply uh, to replenish their fuel. Um, so that's just a, um, a, an interesting note, I think. Um, it's interesting that the cereal ready break was developed at Greenford and later handed over to Wheatbix. And Greenford also produced the first tea bags on the UK market after the war. Well, during the war, the company was involved in many activities, which I won't go into, uh, in support of the war effort. But perhaps the most extraordinary one was the management of one of the largest ordnance factories at Elstow uh, in Bedfordshire. And uh, they were, as you see, they were manufacturing bombs. But they used lions, they invited lions to produce their management, use their employment management skills to oversee this uh, production. And um, it so happens that um, I was giving this talk, um, and a lady came up afterwards and said she had been, as a schoolgirl, living in Elstow. And they knew something was going on. <laughs> but what they probably didn't know was it was being managed by a catering company. <laughs> well, I'm sure I don't need to go up too long with this audience about the very significant development that came about after the war, the design and manufacture of Leo. It's the subject of a separate talk, but I will just say a little about it now, as it is such an important part of the story. The upward trend in office costs made the company realise that some form of automation was essential for such things as their payroll and their management information. And at the time, no one else in the world had thought seriously of developing a, a computer for office or business automation. And so you've seen that self-assurance by the other things I've told you about already. And with that usual self-assurance, the company set about designing and building their own computer. It was not until the project was well underway that the title Leo was coined, standing from four lines electronic office. It seems extraordinary that a catering company with no history of electronics engineering could embark on such a project. But you've got to remember from the outset that the company has developed this DIY culture they were also ahead of their time on office management, so they were confident that seemingly impossible could be achieved as long as it was properly managed and organised. Cambridge University Mathematics Laboratory were at the time designing EDSAC, which I'm sure you know about, and for complex academic calculations, that was the purpose of EDSAC. And although it didn't satisfy the needs of Lyons, the company recognised the value of acquiring technology from Cambridge in, uh, and they came to an agreement uh, to fund or help fund the Cambridge project in return for technology structure which was suitable for Lear. And that was a very clever move. It was the only external help they received. Lyons, of course, recruited engineers as well as members of their own staff to carry out the design and the development work. Well, you're probably all aware of this next slide, the Leo 1. Um, reason for its size, all computers at that stage were of that size. They employed a large number of valves. In fact, they were using more than 6,000 valves and other large, large components and the whole thing occupied 5,000 square feet and had to be <coughs> air-cooled. Um, 
As soon as EDSAC was functioning in 1949, that gave the signal for development work to start on Leo. And it performed its, performed its first operational job on product valuation just two years later, in November 1951. And by the end of 53, Leo was reliable enough to undertake payroll, which was a task which had to be performed at time. Of course, staff had to be paid in those days weekly. The task of calculating an employee's pay until now had taken an experienced clerk eight minutes, and Leo had achieved this job in just one and a half seconds. Well, over the next ten years, more sophisticated versions followed, Leo 2 and then Leo 3, which was fully transistorized and capable of a much wider range of tasks. Publicity for Leo became so widespread that Lyon set up a subsidiary manufacturing company, Leo Computers Limited, and apart from those Leos which were used by Lyons, nearly 70 Leos were eventually produced and purchased by large companies and government departments. And you may not be familiar, this is just uh, of those 67 models, just a small number, just for your sort of information to see the companies who actually uh, bought Leo uh, and also government departments. GPO telephones, they bought 14 models of Leo for use with uh, telephone billing. You remember that uh, GPO uh, before privatisation, uh, used to look after our telephone system. So they bought Leo uh, many times. In fact, they bought when using Leo uh, right up until 1981, GPO. And then the um, HM Dockyards. There was one of each of the Dockyards, Portsmouth, Plymouth, uh, Chatham, and North Rosyth. Um, others who bought it, you see, uh, in the revenue, customs and excise. I have been asked several times if they're still using it there. <laughs> <laughs> and then these amazing exports, including uh, Czechoslovakia, which at the time was still uh, behind the arm curtain. So that's, that's what uh, Leo achieved. Um, everyone finds it fantastic. I think the company that started with tea shops became the pioneer of business computing worldwide. And I'm sure you know that Leo uh, has been acknowledged as the world's very first business computer and achieved that well-deserved place in Guinness Book of World Records. So this seems a good point to tell you how the Joe Lyons Empire itself uh, began to unwind. In the post-war years, Change of eating habits. These caused the restaurants and tea shops to become less popular. There was a new generation which came to prefer fast food, fish to restaurants, and take away food. And Lyons did try to keep up with the times with some successful innovations, such as the London Steakhouses and the Wimpy Bars. Wimpy was an American invention. But after some trial over here, Lange was able to acquire the title, and it opened first in this country in 1953, and more than 500 uh, in the UK were open, and over a thousand overseas. Uh, some of them, that's the headquarters of uh, Chiswick, not, not too far away from Camby Hall, but they uh, used a put windy bars into some of the corner houses. That was one of them, the corner house country street. Windy bar was there on the corner. And some of the tea shops were converted to windy restaurants. But the company's real decline started in the 1970s. It's an old stretch on its borrowings when the UK was hit by the oil crisis in 74, crisis in 74, and then the start of recession, high inflation, and adverse exchange rates. Company losses led to the closure of restaurants, withdrawal of some food products from the market, and in 1978, the company was forced to accept an offer to merge 
with allied breweries limited. Jaylards and Co. sadly lost its independence and became the food division of the new Allied Lions. As you see, it had lasted all that period of time until 78, and it became the food division of the Allied Lions in 78. Uh, the last tea shop was to close in 1981, and the company's component parts were gradually sold to pay for acquisitions which you may not be surprised to know were mainly associated with the drinks trade. Well, the year 18, uh, 1995 marked <coughs> the merger of the company with Pedro Domecq and then became Allied Domecq. 1994, I should say. Uh, in the game of Allied Domecq, the Lions may completely disappear, and that, I'm afraid, was the end of the company. But despite all this, you may find your local supermarket still sells just a few products bearing the brand name of Lyons, for example, Lyons Tea, produced by Tetley. Not surprising, because Tetley was once a Lyons subsidiary. And the factory is at Greenford. If you look closely on the packet of this Lyons Tea, you'll find that Tetley is now owned by Tata Global, who also manufactures steam. If you happen to be visiting the exhibition at Olympia, and you haven't been there recently, just take a walk along the Hammersmith Road, and you'll find Lyons Walk. That was named by the Borough Council as a pedestrian walkway running along the edge of the old Cabby Hall. And here you'll now find a stone, which was unveiled 29th of November last year to commemorate the exact 65th anniversary of Leo becoming operational. Some of us in this room were there on that memorable occasion. And here's a photograph that was taken. You can recognize yourselves, I'm sure. And I should just mention that uh, the opening was carried out by that lovely lady, Dame Stephanie Shirley, who herself has used to run an IT company, some of you may have come across her. And this picture, picture was uh, people who were either involved in Leo or some of the family members <coughs> of Sam Gluckstein and Lyons. Uh, that gentleman there was Dominic Lawson, uh, who is uh, related to the Salmon family. He and Nigel uh, are brothers and sisters, and they're related by the mother's side to the Salmon family. And uh, he, in fact, did write a very good article about this event um, in the uh, Sunday Times, from the Sunday. Um, and just opposite Olympia, there's an English Heritage blue plaque. Uh, that was unveiled just last October. And it was unveiled at the former residence of Joe Lyons, of just opposite Olympia, you'll see, uh, in the Hammersmith Road. Um, or I should say, Sir Joseph Lyons. Uh, he was knighted in 1911 by King George V. Um, I should imagine, mention that although the plaque says pioneer of mass catering, which he was, Joe's knighthood was actually for something quite different. Uh, I told you at the beginning he was a man of many parts, and he became very interested in military matters, and in particular the new territorial force, which was formed in 1908, forerunner of the territorial army. Because Joe became a member of the Territorial Force Association, and probably encouraged by the London Olympics that took place that same year, he pushed for athletics to be included in the training of the Territorials. He organised the athletics events for the London Territorials at Shepherd's Bush in 1909, that's the White City, and National Territorials at Crystal Palace the following year. And it was for this service to the community that Joe received his knighthood. Here's a cutting from the New Year's Honours List um, of the Times, which I don't think you'll be able to read, but I can read you what it says about Joseph Lyons there. 
an energetic and liberal supporter of the London County Territorial Force Association, initiated the territorial sports movement in London, and was chairman of the national meeting held at the Crystal Palace last July, and then goes on to say, is founder and chairman of Joseph Lyons and Co, caterers and chairman of the Strand Hotel Company. So that was what um, he was knighted for, services for the community. Interesting enough, on this slide, uh, sorry, uh, um, there, Henry Wood, who also writes at the same time. And it, what it says about Henry Wood, the well-known conductor of the Queen's Hall Orchestra, which he has directed since 1905, was conductor of the Carl Rosa and other opera companies nearly 20 years ago, and has directed a large number of musical festivals and series of orchestral performances in London and elsewhere. His wife, nay, Princess Olga Rossoff, who died in 1909, was a well-known singer. Doesn't mention the Promenade concerts, it was probably a bit too early for that. Uh, however, so that's just a little bit of interesting. Sir Joseph was also appointed Deputy Lieutenant of the County of London, and that splendid portrait was published in the magazine Vanity Fair. He died in June 1979. Ah, sorry, 1977. <laughs> Not the phone call. June 1917, still in office as the first chairman, without family issue, uh, a few months before his 70th birthday. So you may well have spotted that this year, 2017, marks the centenary of the death of Joseph Lyons. It also happens to be the 170th anniversary of his birthday, and by a further strange coincidence, the 130th. Year anniversary of the foundation of the company in 1887. Well, I hope, ladies and gentlemen, I've been able to demonstrate the ways in which this remarkable company uh, became distinguished over a period of 100 years, performing a vast number of activities uh, within the catering industry and also outside of it. Some of the features are well known to most of you, such as the tea shops, corner houses, and of course the nippy waitresses. But I believe that other activities, like the huge banquets and outside catering, may well have surprised you, each one demonstrating the creativity and management skills of the Lions organization. And to this audience, I need hardly add that perhaps their most extraordinary innovation was the Leo computer. Thank you very much.
Uh, he left school rather early, and he, he, later in his life, and I remember him saying to me and others that he was very aggrieved that his father had taught his two elder brothers Latin and Greek, and as a result they went to Oxford, but his father refused to teach him Latin and Greek. Probably wasn't bright enough, I don't know. So he left early on, and he went to work for Cadby Hall for a while, and then, then went to British Columbia just before World War I. Uh, the question I had, I wondered, in the archives, do you keep lists of employees, you know, would his name still be there, if, if, what he was really doing, or anything like that? Well, we, I hope that everything I can time. suggest is the, all the archives of the large company are held at the London Metropolitan Archives, the museums, and I have been asked this sort of question before, there isn't a sort of list of employees, but the only way to trace employees really is to go into the um, stock of large mail, the you know, in-house magazine, where quite a number of the employees were mentioned. Um, and that's a, a bit of a sort of old way of doing it, but that is the, really the only way of tracing the employees. Okay, thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. Any further questions? Just a comment. Um, you showed us a slide of Zadell's. Um, he's not too sorry. Right. You showed us a slide of the Zadell restaurant. Oh, yes. Uh, my wife's pen pals uh, went to it recently. We, we all, all four of us went together. And we had great difficulty keep convincing these people from Los Angeles that this tea shop company had actually produced the world's first business computer. That's how bad it could possibly be done. But we did convince them in the end. And it's well worth it. <laughs> All right. I can't see any more hands. No. In which case, I uh, just thank you again. Absolutely fascinating. The story, I'm sure you found the same, is all sorts of links, the uh, triggers that go as you tell the story. They go, oh, yes, I remember that one. I remember, I remember the corner house. Yes, when I was this high. I went to Zadel. Zed for the first time last Friday. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's fantastic. I couldn't believe it. Yeah. Know, I was weird, so. And they had a band playing. Oh, which really? was a, yes, yes, at 9.30, a, <laughs> a, a, a band came and played, so we all didn't still carry on. Yeah. But to tell a story like that in such an amusing and informative way is a real skill, and we've been very lucky to have it. I appreciate it, and I'm sure you do very much. Thank you very much.